Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, the idea of today is sort of to talk about the open source intelligence project that um, Daisy Arch and Daisy have been working on. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it to you. So Daisy, do you want to give us a sort of brief summary of who you are, what you've been doing? Yeah, so um, I'm Daisy, obviously. I worked in applied behavioral analysis and I was one of the researchers for our Crash for Cash project. Um, I research behavior patterns of companies that we think are committing fraud, and hopefully that can be used to teach AI. I'm Devyansh. So my work related to legal analysis of Crash for Cash, I looked at various laws and how individuals tend to bypass them and how we can use them uh, effectively when data has been collected through AI. All right, cool, cool. So really, I think um, Daisy, uh, from what you learned uh, regarding obviously the research and the supply chain, obviously Chris, like I say, has worked on these cases when he was in the, in the police. Anything specific that uh, that you would put post in terms of questions? Um, the first kind of question I have is, what kind of things have you seen in terms of organised crime? Uh, well, that's a big question. So, <laughs> I've been organised crime doesn't care what the commodity is they simply care for the cash so mm -hmm. they're it's highly flexible it's amoeba like so if you if you cut off one avenue of easy cash they they migrate very quickly to another avenue so they don't care whether it's some whether it's uh <clears throat> fake tobacco or uh, indecent images of children you know if it's if there's money to be made then and there's a there's a loophole or a um or a, or a hole in the system then that's where that's where they will go and so crash for cash uh has become a lucrative avenue for them because the chances of getting caught are very small and the penalties on being caught are even smaller so it's um it's the perfect combination for for criminals yeah, what I would say is, is it's a, if you follow the money, generally you can follow the uh, the journey to the top of the particular organised crime tree. And um, as Chris has alluded to, they don't they don't care about what they are engaged in. It can be anything from the issues that you mentioned. It's people, of course. You know, trafficking people uh, worldwide has become a significant issue these days. Um, so where, wherever, and there always seem to be one step ahead of criminal justice. Um, I think that's the thing, is the criminal justice authorities, um, they will find another loophole or another uh, means by which to commit these crimes. And we're always trying to play catch up. So, so what I think was it was interesting, some of the research that came out was obviously where, where the insurance companies can intervene, right? So Divyanj was looking to some of the laws because it, basically the services, you know, the insurance company as well as the police are overwhelmed. Divya, you came up with some interesting stuff, didn't you, regarding where the, 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 the... Yeah, mostly it's about Insurance Act 2015, which said that uh, once a, a claim has been called fraudulent, the company need not pay the money to, uh, need not pay any money to the insurers or any other sort. They have two options, either they accept it's fraudulent and not do anything, or not accept fraudulent and still they don't have to do anything specifically. Uh, Nazir, I wanted to ask, uh, as let's say a hypothetical situation where the AI we are working on works and we get like hundreds of cases regularly. So how much of proof do we need to go with the intervention? Like uh, we can't really prosecute all the cases that are being given to us if that's the situation. So what can we do instead? I think it needs to be said, um, and I speak about the UK here, that UK 40% of all, cr all crime is online it's fraud it's fraud of a fraudulent nature uh but policing i think as allocates and chris may correct me about 1.2 percent of its resources to dealing with it so uh it's a significant portion of crime but a significantly low amount of resource attached to it which is why um and criminal justice is across the board so prosecutors the courts themselves they don't have the resource to deal with everything that's thrown at them uh, and so you have to make it as easy as possible for them, in effect, providing them with a package of the evidence so they don't have to do uh, the hard work, which they currently can't, aren't resourced to do. Um, they they recognize, and I think this needs to be said, Divyesh, that um, if you tackle this type of crime, you're also tackling other types of crime. 
So, uh, you know, we know about, for example, terrorist activity or um, other serious organized crime. Um, they often use the money they generate from organized crime of this nature for other crime. And so there is a strong business case to tackle this type of work. Um, but as I said, there there isn't the capacity currently or the capability to do that, which is why you, we have to help um, those who are um, the victims of this type of behavior uh, to present the strongest possible case. And that means sometimes, um, sometimes uh, where we think, oh, you know, it's clearly wrong and what they've done is clearly wrong. Uh, it, we, we shouldn't be burdening um, the justice authorities with those types of cases. We should be going high, in effect, those that are, uh, involve the greatest loss, those that are the most organized. So if there's a real pattern and they're quite successful in what they're doing, or those are the ones that we should be uh, assisting the authorities in targeting. Um, but as I said, it goes back to the plain point of yes, which is about you. We need to provide them with the, the literally here is the evidence. Here's everything you need. Then all you need to do is put a bow on the top of it and take it to court. And I think that's uh, that's where we, people go wrong. Generally, is they make a report very early on and expect the authorities to investigate, but they don't have the capacity or the capability to do so insurance companies see fraudulent claims as just a cost of doing business and they pass it on to their clients and therefore you we we are the clients if we get wholly compensated for a rather unpleasant action we on we, we tend to get not too exercised about it um and, and that, uh, going back to to naza's point about there's only one point two percent of policing resources go into 40 percent of their crime i mean the police take a very sort of narrow view of the the policing mission which is the the public are the police and the police are the public and what the police ought to do is being engaged the engage the citizen army in doing some of this work so have you heard of bellingcat have you heard of bellingcat yes yeah yeah. i know you have but i don't know whether day well Bell, have you heard of it dinish yeah yeah so daisy bellingcat is a is a little organ well it's quite big now but it's an organization based in leicestershire in england where mm -hmm. there's a worldwide group of volunteers who can who could actually provide evidence for war crimes I and mean, they can identify missiles that have been fired from the back of rockets and illegally and because they've got hundreds thousands of volunteers that are prepared to join in the business of tracking down you know serious events and what the police are doing is finding a way of encouraging this citizen army who are all brilliant online and saying how can we collectively the police are the people and the people are the police actually mm -hmm. sort it out for ourselves rather than leaving it to the 130,000 professionals most of whom don't know their way around a computer you know? yeah no that's absolutely right I mean tackling crime we always say it's everybody's business but that's actually not true and Bellingcat's a really good example of using open source material I mean they, they, they don't have um the ability to tap phones or uh, carry out surveillance they simply go online and use every tool available to try and identify as, as chris said war crimes and other types of crimes and if we if we were able i mean given what you said a moment ago that we're all paying the price for this every insurance mm -hmm. company is raising everybody's premiums as a result of the fact that this fraud is taking place if we're all paying the price for this there is no reason why dvs Daisy, we can't find, well, they can't find tens of thousands of members of the public who, in their spare time almost, and, and you know, the, we all know right now there's a real interest in true crime um, to the point where, you know, more, more, people, more people watch dramas that are true crime than anything else. It's about accessing that interest and that passion and using it for good. And I think that's something that we can help. So, as I said, but isn't there a question about open source intelligence and how much data an insurance company can farm or you know private individuals can provide? Is there a, a, an AI or ethics? Uh, well, and that's where AI comes in, isn't it? I mean, as an individual, uh, AI has the ability to analyze data at a, at a speed that human beings can't uh, and identify patterns that human beings can't. So, this is where AI comes in. Um, uh, to be able to do this on an industrial level rather than, you know, one person identifying one criminal somewhere. I, um, so there's two issues. There's the prosecution of those who um, can be seen to have committed a crime where the evidence is powerful. And then there's the contractual bit where insurance companies aren't obliged to pay out on a contract where there's something dubious about the contract. Where uh, And of course, 
the balance of power lies with the person who's got the money and the insurance company until they've paid they've got the money so they could be more resolute i think in squashing some of these claims but because they just pass the cost of the claim on to the next everybody every other um like every other uh, policy holder pays for the um the dubious ones they just see you know it's three percent of the cost of their doing business there so everybody pays a bit more and, and um, also chris they all, they're, 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 it's easy to go for low-hanging fruit isn't it yes they will go for the easy cases to be yep. able uh where somebody uh, has really been really poor in their in their and how they've committed this rather than the more sophisticated ones and some sophisticated ones that are ripping us all off day in day out yeah Cool, cool. Okay, so look, we're, we're going to be continuing our sort of open source intelligence. Divyash and Daisy are our part of the team going forward. We've got a project that runs at the end of July. If you're okay with it, Chris and, and Nazir will give you some sort of results from that. There should be some code that we've generated, we've started generating that's linking various sources of data together. Uh, and like I said, we're trying to basically get the influences of these crimes, right? not, not the, the, the passengers, you know, whose names are being used and things like that as well. So, and, and even um, we've got one or two insurers outside of the UK that are interested in perhaps providing some data. So, yeah, uh, thanks uh, for your time, Chris. Thanks for your time. That's it. Go on, Chris. Yes. No, I'd say, have you, have you done any work with sort of Facebook and Instagram? Not sort of with them as companies, I mean, with the, with the material that's generated, because there's that... There's that thing about, you know, somebody who can't stay off social media, um, who then makes a claim for a car accident and there's nothing on social media about it. You know, the, you know, the, the absence of evidence of me, I've just had an accident. Um, is it like perhaps evidence of the absence of a, an accident in the first place? I don't know whether you've done any work around that. Yeah, we found some interesting information on um, Facebook and Instagram specifically. Yes. Are very, they've got such big egos. Uh, they will put uh, things on social media which they think, which which are plain to their audience, you know, the lives, the very nice cars they have or the nice houses they have, um, which again helps in, in, in building a case and also uh, in prioritizing their case. So, you know, as I said a moment ago, they, the police would like to go after the big fish, uh, uh, but they don't know who they are. So we can help them. You can help them identify who those big fish are. Yeah, one example specifically we found was um, there was this person who was claiming on insurance, but on their Facebook they were posting holiday pictures and apparently they couldn't walk. But yeah, yeah, it, it was the Agrobus love day case wherein they put in a fraud uh, claim of one million uh, pounds saying that the husband cannot work and uh, the private investigators found data on their uh, photos on their Facebook saying that he could actually move and uh, they are enjoying everything. Yes. Yeah. And of course, I mean, in investigating that type of case in the real world, i.e. putting surveillance on them, that sort of thing, is very expensive. Yeah. Um, and then also the loopholes of Data Protection Act that we have to deal with. Exactly. Well, I, uh, yes, I don't, I mean, the Data Protection Act doesn't really apply to data publicly available. So if you um, personally post in a public forum information that you want the world to see, then the Data Protection Act doesn't, doesn't give you any data privacy around that information. And uh, Raj and I had a very painful trip to Norwich about 10 years ago where we were trying to, um, we were trying to encourage Norwich Union, as they used to be then, Aviva, as they are now, to apply some um, social media monitoring on, on dodgy um, car crash applicants. And honestly, it was like talking to the health and safety manager at Brent Council. They were... Um, oh, wow. <laughs> it was just all too difficult. But um, they were saying, oh, we can't go intruding into the... And, you know, you you could do, you could do social media... Pub, the, mo the, the monitoring of people's public social media posts to see whether or not they're congruent with their claims for the injury damage and loss that they've suffered uh, and you know you could run that in the background and insurance companies could run that and um because private investigators looking is very expensive right you've got to go and revisit and revisit whereas if you could hook up hook up a tool um you know that you you well there's it's obvious what you could achieve really potentially i mean a link to